I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about the imprisoned Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich, who was taken by the Russians and arrested for espionage, we have with us our Europe and Eurasia program director, Max Bergman. Max, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. It's Passover. Evan Gershevich is in a Russian jail. He's 31. It's got to be pretty harrowing. Oh, yes. And I think everyone's sort of heart goes out to him and, and his family who, you know, don't know when or how he's going to be returned or going to make it home. This was, you know, this is clearly a hostage taking. And I think that's how this has to be seen. This isn't a, a case of Evan doing anything wrong, but doing what he was there to do, which was journalism and reporting. Now, you know, sometimes I think a lot of times anxious security services can see the 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 line between, you know, run the mill journalism, good journalism and espionage where you're talking to people trying to find out things. There can be a blurring, but let's be clear, you know, the Russian intelligence services definitely knew who he was, definitely knew what he was doing. And so if the, you know, the notion that the CIA or anyone else would use someone like a normal reporter to do espionage on behalf of the US government when all eyes are on them by the Russian security services, it's just absolute craziness. And it's just not true. And we know that and we can presume that. And so what this is, is I think the Russians are uh, needed to take a hostage. And why did they need to take a hostage? Well, there's been a lot of cases of Russian undercover uh, spies around the world being nabbed, being uh, arrested in Europe, in the United States and Brazil. And, you know, they needed some leverage to, they need something to trade to get their real spies out. And this is, you know, people that were, you know, if you've seen the Americans, these are people that are under deep cover that are not there uh, as sort of standard intelligence officers that oftentimes are at embassies where we're trying to figure out who at the embassy is actually a Russian intelligence officer, but they have the diplomatic cover. And these are people that the Russians have tried to implant into the United States, into European countries that um, are deep cover, that are there, not under any diplomatic immunity. And you discover them, you can arrest them. They're, there's no obligation to return them. They're imprisoned on espionage charges. So the Russians are, you know, there's a lot of these people that are in, in European prisons and the Russians want, need something to trade. And so this is a hostage taking where they don't, they couldn't get, you know, a legitimate American spy. So what they're doing is now targeting journalists. So they pick a prominent journalist from one of our three most important newspapers, and they just think that's okay. Well, I think what they're doing is clearly sending a message that they frankly now don't care about having thorough coverage of their country in the West. And, you know, my guess is Evan was doing some you know deep reporting, real reporting, and also sending a message to other journalists that are trying to do that. Don't do that. This is the fate that could await you. And it's part of, I think, you know, Russia, sort of the North Koreanization of, of Russia, uh, to maybe steal a term from Mark, Mark Galeotti, a, a Russia analyst in the UK, where you've seen a lot where Russia is now turning increasingly inward, very skeptical of, of outward assessments that, and uh, of, of their country. And so having Western journalists run around Russia is something that I think they're very nervous about. They don't want the West to have a real understanding of what's happening in Russia, because they also don't want the Russian public to have a real understanding of a lot of what's happening in Russia. They want to control the information. And just as you see in North Korea, not many journalists running around Pyongyang. I think many, I would assume, many Western press organizations are assessing the security of their reporters and whether it's safe to continue to report inside of Russia. And, you know, the Russians calculated this. They knew they know that there's going to be a reaction and it means that they don't care. They don't care about uh, how they're seen and how they're perceived in, in that way. I mean, let's not forget, you know, the New York Times once had White House correspondent Peter Baker in Russia. There's been so many well-known and highly respected journalists who have covered Russia from within Russia. 
I guess what you're saying now is this is going to have a real chilling effect. The Times and the Post and NBC News and others, you know, they can't imagine probably having their correspondence exposed the way they are. Right. Or they're going to significantly curtail what they can and cannot do, you know, cover this, don't cover that. And that's not a, you know, a stain on, on them. It's they have to, each of these news organizations have to make a determination of what could get them crosswise with, with the, with the Kremlin and what is safe to do in, in that country. And it, what we're seeing is a move toward the Russia, you know, it was always an autocratic regime would crack down on journalists. Many journalists in Russia would be assassinated or killed, but you know, it was an autocratic state that had a lively civil discourse and discussion. And now we're seeing sort of a totalitarian shift. They don't want to be covered. They want to be a, an insular state, it seems like. And this is a regime that I think is very paranoid about its stability. And so that, I think, is part of what it, we're, we're getting at here is that I don't know what stories you know, Evan was working on at the Wall Street Journal, but I, you know, I assume some deep reporting, you know, a lot of reporters are poking about, are there splits within the regime? And, you know, Russian journalists aren't probably doing that right now uh, to the same degree, or the Russian journalists that were are now outside of Russia. And so here's American journalists poking around where we don't want them to poke, and we're going to send a message to, to lay off. Well, and as you mentioned earlier, this is out of the playbook of North Korea and Kim Jong-un. I wonder if Vladimir Putin is comfortable not being seen as a major world leader and instead being seen more in the light of Kim Jong-un. And the only reason anybody you know, cares about him is they're afraid of him. I think right now, this is a regime that is you know, stuck in a war that is grinding on and it is costing the Russian government a, a lot of money to fight this war. Wars are incredibly expensive. And while that had provided sort of a stimulus to their economy initially, you know, if you pump a bunch of money into your defense industry and creates jobs and things like that, and you're paying the widows of, of, of Russians that have been killed, that's another stimulus. Uh, and then the oil prices were high, but now the oil prices aren't high. Energy flows to Europe have been cut off. The Russian budget's going to be in trouble. There's going to you're going to there's going to be some belt tightening, and that is all going to reverberate inside of Russia. Real concern about you know what the state of the war. So I think this is a regime that made a huge gamble on Ukraine. They're, that that bet is they're they're losing that bet, and you know the sort of image of Putin as this sort of leader that doesn't make mistakes, that rides on horseback, you know, shirtless and is this 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 really strong leader, you know, that that's key to his legitimacy at home. And I think that bubble is starting to be burst. And and if the Ukrainians are able to go on a counteroffensive this spring or into the summer that's successful, it's gonna, it's gonna have real ramifications for for Putin. I don't know how, I don't know what that will turn out, but I know that this is this is the regime that is reducing the resilience that it has. And I think that's maybe the way to view it is that it is reducing its resilience. And then if you have a bunch of Western, you know, American reporters poking around, talking to other oligarchs, you know, or other powerful people in the regime, and it's the regime's increasingly paranoid about stability, well, we're we're gonna put a stop to that. And I think that's that's what we're seeing here right now. That's a really important point, Max. What does this say? It doesn't say anything good, but what does it say about the U.S.-Russia relationship at this point? Well, this is like Brittany Griner 2.0. Yeah, I mean, this is this is. Uh, I mean, the, the relationship's already kind of at its you know nadir uh, since the the depths of the Cold War. Whether you want to go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, historians can can say how deep, but. You know, there was sort of a rules of the road for how we were going to treat each other's people during the Cold War, where, and it took us a little while to figure it out, you know, the spy wars that were happening and how we treated treated each other's intelligence officers. But then, you know, there was also, there were, there was Soviet press here. We had American press in, in Moscow during the Soviet period. And this is a sign that, you know, Americans in Russia need to be very wary and probably shouldn't necessarily be there unless they have a really good reason to be there because uh, this is a regime that's now willing to take hostages. And that was the Brittany Geiner case where, you know, completely 
a, you know, a ridiculous charge to then, you know, put someone in prison for. Uh, and it was because they were trying to extract someone and they succeeded and they got Victor boot. And there's a lot of questions about whether that was the right call. I think it's a very, very tough on the administration. The guy had been, you know, in, you know, was a notorious arms trafficker had been in prison now for, for more than a decade. And so I think, you know, the administration viewed it well, he did pay a price and they needed to free Brittany Griner, but that's what you know, the Russians are going to do, are doing now. Uh, and you can see this with uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Ryabkov uh, hinting, saying, well, we're not ready to talk about exchanges right now. But what that is uh, says is that, well, they're thinking about talking about exchanges. So, you know, he'll be charged with espionage. He's going to be convicted. And then, you know, he's going to spend months in, in prison. And then the Russians will come and say, well, we want these five people or however many return to Russia because these are ridiculous charges against them. And, and we'll give them those people. Well, we'll, we'll enter into a, an intense negotiation. And this is where it's it's kind of no win for the Biden administration where there's no, you know, all, all decisions here are bad, right? Where, you know, making a trade is bad because you're sort of submitting the hostage taking, but not making a trade is also bad because here's a guy who's 31, who has a family or, you know, his family is worried sick about him, who just doesn't deserve to be in prison. And there's also Paul Whelan, who's also uh, still, still in Russian custody. And so you want to free these people. You know, this is where you got to make the the tough call, and I think eventually, hope I'm hoping that you know he will be free, and there'll be some sort of a trade or negotiation. Um, but I think then other journalists need to think about their presence in Russia, and I hate to say that because, you know, as a think tank analyst that focuses on Russia, I really depend on their work. It's important, uh, and so that is the really tough trade off that right now Russia is is imposing on the administration and, and potentially all news news media outlets. So we do think that Evan has prospects for release, though, don't we? I would think so. I think there's, as as I just noted, I think what will happen is that this will go through the Russian uh, quote quote system. He'll be convicted. And, you know, I think on a charge that will be espionage, very serious, many years in prison, and then there'll be talks. And, you know, the administration will likely engage in those talks, but, you know, you never know what could get in the way of that, right? Maybe the Ukrainians go on a massive offensive, are successful, there's peace negotiations, the Russians are not going to free him until the end of peace negotiations. Who knows? There are a lot of hypothetical uh, scenarios. We, you know, uh, Jason Rezian, the Washington Post reporter that was essentially held hostage by the Iranians, you know, uh, lasted years. So I think the hope is that that's not the case, but this is now, you know, up to Vladimir Putin to make a decision on on his fate and is going to try to leverage every everything he can out of having him hostage. Do we have a sense of what life is like for Evan, you know, being imprisoned in Russia? Well, it's not good. I I think there is still a sense uh, uh, on the part of the Russian authorities that they're, you know, they're not trying to you know, treat him in a way that would be, you know, subject to torture and other things like that. But, you know, I think Brittany Griner was treated as kind of a normal prisoner. They're probably trying to dissuade the sort of, you know, attacks that might come if there was absolutely no attention on this case. So my hope is that, I mean, it's not going to be a, a fun or pleasant time in prison, but hopefully uh, his health and, and safety are, are being preserved by Russia because that would, you know, I think spur a really strong reaction from the U.S. government. And they want, you know, they want to protect their hostage in this sense. So this is not going to be, I think, a, a pleasant period for for anybody from some of the ambassadors that uh, have sp spoken, noted their conversations that they've had with detained Americans. You know, the treatment isn't great. You're in prison and the food, you know, all, everything that you can imagine of a Russian prison system, but they're, you know, still able to kind of, they're treated in a way that's somewhat humanely, or at least that's, our fingers are crossed for that. Do we, you know, we just have Brittany Griner home pretty recently. I know each person's different, but how damaged 
our people when they are returned from Russia as hostages? I think it's a really tough question. And I think it's, you know, anyone that has been in that sort of situation, I don't know. I think everyone's going to react differently where you don't know if there's going to be a deal. This could be your fate for a very, very long time. And in some ways, you probably need to come to terms with that. It's probably very difficult to come to terms with that. And I think that is what is so damaging, what's so terrible about this is how arbitrary it is. And so, you know, I think hopefully for Evan and for others, there's hope. There's hope that the U.S. government's going to be working hard, that the White House has said, has called this what it is, the hostage taking is committed to getting them out. I think the one thing that we have to remember here also is that there's a number of Russian journalists that are serving prison sentences most on almost all on trumped up charges and they have no hope of really of getting out until you know their sentence is served or you know something changes with the regime and so i think the hope here for evan is that the us government works hard to get him out that that something happens where he's able to be released and that the russians realize that this is terrible image terrible look for them all around and that this is not what they want and and hopefully there's sh- this happens very quickly but I, I think he probably needs to be prepared for the long haul here. Max, thank you very much for this really difficult discussion. We really hope and pray that Evan is okay over in Russia. Thanks so much, Andrew. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 